Good afternoon, or good morning, depending on whether you're doing this um, inclusion and diversity in, at Waverley or in the city. Um, at this very moment, I'm at a conference, a diversity conference in Hong Kong, so I'm very sorry not to be able to be here for the first session. Um, but in due course, you'll probably be glad that I missed the first session because you'll be so sick of me talking about inclusion and diversity by the end that it's probably a good thing to have a bit of an easy start. Although knowing Mary, she's going to be um, sitting in, she won't let you have a very easy start. So the first thing I want to talk about is that when um, I was very much younger than I am today, you'll see a picture of me on the corner there, um, I already had a great interest in inclusion and in diversity. And this is actually a picture of me um, learning a dance and a song that is sung to very young um, brides that are about to um, get married. And my interest in diversity and inclusion has continued over many, many years. Now, what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be examining um, the outline and the assignments for the duration of the course. We're not going to spend too much time on the assignments because next week when I'm back, we can have a much closer look at it. Because in any case, I don't want to miss that very important process of having everyone hanging on my every word, which, is only, which only happens when you talk about assignments generally in a lecture. Um, then we're going to examine two different terms. Um, what, is, what, are, what is our understanding of diversity and inclusion? And then a very brief overview of inclusion and exclusion. Now assignment one, as I said, we're going to look at it more carefully next week. But if you look in there, it's an essay. And most importantly, if you look near the bottom, you'll see that it is an either-or essay. So you need to, check, to, fix, to, to think about either socioeconomic disadvantage, displacement, and or grief. Now, lots of students over the past have said, do we have to do all of that? The very fact that it says and or means you can choose one or you can choose more of them. The second assignment is a annotated folio and for the annotated folio it's much more complicated as you can see and I will um, spend more time explaining it when I get back because um, it's far too complicated to, to do anything um, other than just show it to you today. Um, what I'd like you to do between now and next week is to look at both of the assignments and come ready with any questions you might have about them. Uh, that carries on to the second assignment as well. Now if we look at diversity, diversity refers to variety and numerous ways in which people may differ. Characteristics that con constitute differences between individuals or groups are studied and valued within the area of diversity. Diversity may also be different in relation to pers perspectives, ideas, philosophies, and values. Now, one of the important things that we need to remember is that because of the successive waves of migration that have occurred in this country, in today's society, we are probably one of the most um, diverse um, groups of people in the world. And according to um, Kate Donnellan in 2009, she spoke about that particularly in relation to ethnic and linguistic diversity and the, and the great range of diversity we have in this country. So of course it's really, really important for us as early childhood educators to think carefully about what that means um, in terms of our practice. So what categories of diversity can you identify? Um, I'm obviously not here to hear your um, responses, but think about them quickly. Jot them down and we'll see in the next slide how many of them you've actually come up with in your jotting down. So I'm going to give you like two minutes 
and um, I'm going to try and stand still in that two minutes. Um, maybe Mary can switch off the, uh, <laughs> the <laughs> thing for two seconds so that you can think you can jot down um, some diversity. Right, so this is the list of some of the aspects of diversity. Have a look and see um, what you've got, if there are any extra ones, and so on. We will talk about that when I get back um, next um, time. Just have a look at the list quickly, or slowly. And of course you can always go back to this because it will be on, um, on Moodle. I have to get the bigger um, one of this so I can look properly. Um, so the cultural iceberg is something that's been talked about for a number of years, starting with um, Edward Hall in the 1970s, who I think is attributed, who, who, who most people attribute the idea of the cultural iceberg to. Um, so if we look at the, at the cultural iceberg, um, we have what is termed surface cultures and then deep cultures. And if you look there, the surface cultures are the kinds of things that we often um, look at in, in educational environments like food, flags, festivals, fashion, etc. Um, and then the, the deep um, cultures are less superficial um, aspects of culture like communicating styles and rules. Um, facial expressions, gestures, etc. Notions of courtesy and manners, concepts of self, time, past and future, attitudes towards different things like attitudes towards elders that may differ from culture to culture, or adolescence, or dependence, and so on, and approaches to some of the, the, the milestones in our lives like religion, courtship, marriage, etc. may be very different. Um, in terms of different cultural identities and, and aspects. And if we think about a ship, and the ship is uh, careering towards this iceberg, what the ship sees is those um, surface um, um, layers of the iceberg, so the surface cultures, if you like. And because of that, because it's, it's very obvious and very evident, um, that is where... Um, people in education often sort of direct the ship towards towards uh, food and fashion and, and so on, and, and 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 often forget to look deeper and where the real danger is. Because of course that's where where people can have lots of conflicting ideas and opinions when it comes to things like attitudes and beliefs and 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 structures. Um, but that's the core, really, of what we need to get at if we're going to be really looking at inclusion and diversity in any effective manner. Now, there are a lot of people who argue very strongly that um, those first things like foods and flags and festivals and performances are, often lead to a very tokenistic um, aspect of culture and, and so they tend to avoid them because they don't want to be in trouble for being tokenistic. But I would argue that that's often a very real and very good place to start. Um, as long as we don't keep um, our children in that domain of culture, as long as we, 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 we then dig deeper and further into that cultural iceberg. But it's often a very good starting place because it's something that is overt, people can see it, people can relate to it, um, etc. So I would argue very strongly that we, we do need to look at both the surface cultural features and the um, deep cultural features. Now, um, next slide, first of all. Um, these figures are all taken from um, the June 2011 Australian Bureau of Statistics, because as you know, um, statistics are not done every year, and also they take some time to um, reach the, um, uh, the general population, etc. So we'll take the 2011 statistics, um, and first of all, if we look at um, um, some of the features, 
it said that 5.3 million first generation Australians um, are, 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 are here. So 27% of the population, which is quite a large percentage if you think that they are first generation, they're the first people in their families to, to, to live and work in Australia. And then 4.1 million people are second generation Australians. Um, so that's about 20% of the population. And then 10.6 million, and of course it, that's a big leap between 4.1 and 10.6, are third plus generation Australians, 53% of the population. Um, so, uh, of course that does make up the more or less the bigger chunk. Not too much bigger as you can see from the, from the pie graph, because the other side is about 47%, the first and second generation combined. So there are many people living in the country that are, are fairly new in terms of their, their birth and ancestry and so on. And for whatever reason, Perth, Sydney and Melbourne have had the highest proportion of overseas born people, um, which was over a third each. Um, and I suppose it's mainly because those are the, um, the city areas um, and, the, and the most well-known. Um, for instance, when I lived in South Africa, we had a saying, packing for Perth, because many people only knew a one country in the whole um, of Australia that they wanted to immigrate to, and that was Perth for whatever, whatever reason. Um, so I find that really interesting in terms of diversity, that there are, there are a large percentage of people who are first and second generation um, um, Australians. Um, then if we look at countries of birth, um, and, and I'm not going to worry too much about um, the per thousand, etc. But if we look at the proportion of, of all overseas born people, of course the biggest proportion is the United Kingdom, um, with 20.8% because of the, Australia's kind of um, Commonwealth ties, etc. It makes sense that that would be the biggest proportion of people to be moving to um, Australia. And then we look down, um, those, are the other, those are the other places that have the most people that have, have moved. New Zealand being the second one, then China, India. Vietnamese, Philippines, and then of course the most important country in the world, South Africa, with 2.8% uh, no, um, proportion of, of people born overseas. Actually it feels a lot more because I seem to, to encounter many South Africans in Australia, but 2.8% is, is quite a large proportion. Um, and then the, the bottom one is a, com a combination of all of the people where, where, where else they were born. So that's why it's a large percentage because it's made up of a very small percentage of different countries put together. Um, another interesting um, statistic is the number of males per 100 females. Um, and you'll see that in some countries definitely there are more um, males that have immigrated, but if you look at something like um, South Africa, 96.9, it means that there are, there are slightly more um, uh, females that have immigrated to, from South Africa to Australia. Um, so if we continue to look around diversity, and we obviously know that statistics can sometimes be skewed because not even though um, it is um, considered compulsory, many people might fall through the net and there may well be um, you know, larger numbers than, than, than sometimes is um, shown through statistics. But the statistics show that um, 54837 <laughs> people are identified as being of Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander origin and um, some of them are, like 90% of them are average, uh, identified as Aboriginal only, 6% um, Torres Strait Islander origin only, and then 4% are identified as both. Um, so, clearly in the Northern Territory, there are more people identified as um, of Aboriginal descent, um, just under 27% 
um, in all of other jurisdictions, 4% or less of the population. And Victoria has the lowest proportion, 0.7 of the state total. Um, that doesn't mean that we don't need to be looking at diversity issues in terms of, of Aboriginal um, cultures. Um, I would argue that even where there is a completely monocultural society, um, we would still be needing to be sharing resources from different cultural practices. So if you look at inclusion, which I had lost, oh, it is, um, is the process by which diverse groups of in individuals are supported, respected and valued through creating affirming, welcoming spaces and climates that elicit a sense of belonging. Um, and if you think about the frameworks, there is constantly that um, reference to belonging, being and becoming, which are all exceptionally important in terms of creating an inclusive um, society. It's the active, intentional and ongoing engagement with diversity in people, in the curriculum, in the co-curriculum and intellectual, social, cultural and geographical communities with which individuals might connect in ways that increase one's awareness, content knowledge, cognitive sophistication and empathetic understanding of the complex ways individuals interact with systems. Now that's quite a mouthful but really what I think is important in there is to see that it's, the diversity is much broader than just people. It's um, curriculum diversity, co-curriculum, um, different aspects of curriculum, intellectual, social, etc. Um, the increased, increasing awareness, content knowledge, um, understanding of the complex ways individuals interact. And as we go through this course, we'll be looking more carefully at that notion of complex ways and how complex actually culture is in terms of people not necessarily only being um, focused on one culture themselves, having multiple cultural identities that brings its own sense of complexity. So... Um, Inclusion, if we talk inclusion, it's founded basically on human rights principles and we're all aware of human rights um, and, and, and what that entails. Um, it's recognised in international law and conventions um, on the basis of consensus within the international community um, that they are inherent amongst humanity. Um, human rights generally focuses in inclusion on action and change and how do we best change to accommodate and to uh, value those human rights. Um, and equity is, is key to both human rights and inclusion. And if you look at that picture there, it's a, I think it's a very good example of the difference between equity and equality. And often in, in educational circles we talk, circles, we talk about uh, the need for equality, but it is in fact far more important to look at equity because equity is about fairness, it's about um, giving um, people the opportunity to engage. So if you look at that picture, um, there is equality on the left hand side and of course that poor little, I'm assuming they're all boys because they look like it, but maybe they're girls, who knows. Um, that poor little boy at the end um, can't see a thing. Um, so um, he's not able to really engage in looking at that match. Whereas with equity, um, it's fair because they can all see, but he's been given a little bit more support in terms of those boxes that have been built up. Um, and if we think about that, I used to get really tired um, when... when the early, in the early days of human rights, when all we heard all the time was level the playing field. And in a, but in a way, that's what is happening there. Is they're levelling the playing field so that everyone can actually see. And, and, and it is a good, um, and it is a very effective way of ensuring equity. So, rights-based edu rights education. Rights-based approaches 
set out to foster meaningful engagement and participation so that people are provided with the space and resources to shape the decisions and initiatives that affect their lives. Now, rights-based education, what are rights? Human rights are about recognizing and respecting the inherent value and dignity of all people. Human rights standards are contained in internationally agreed human rights treaties and declarations. And if you look up there, you'll see a list of some of the um, documents that are available on internet um, and that have been created over the years. Um, so, human rights instruments relevant to student diversity, and I'm not going to go into all of them, but you can see that the earliest ones were right from 1951, um, and the latest ones around 2009, and so on. So, inclusion is seen as a process of addressing and responding to the diversity of needs of all children, youth and adults, through increasing participation in learning cultures and communities, and reducing and eliminating exclusion within and from education. And as you can see, I have highlighted what I think is exceptionally important for us, and that's trying to find within educational spaces increasing participation in learning cultures and communities. It involves changes and modifications in content, approaches, structures and strategies with a common vision that covers all children and a conviction that it is the responsibility of the regular system to edu educate all children. So inclusion is generally um, um, contrasted with exclusion um, because we tend to, particularly in Western society, we tend to see things in polar dimensions, inclusion as opposed to exclusion. Um, historically, the emphasis was on poverty, um, and, and it was historically understood as a deficit rather than um, strength-based. So what someone or an individual or group does not have, that was what, fo what was focused on what they do not have, and particularly in relation to poverty. And hopefully um, Mary will have shown you, and Sue, sorry, because Sue's going to be doing it on Saturday, will we'll sh show you that uh, cracked pot video um, at the beginning of the session um, before they go on to my wonderful speech. Um, and that really shows how, how we, it's a really great story emphasising strength-based approaches to inclusion as opposed to deficit um, bases of inclusion. Um, poverty on its own does not provide a wide enough lens, but for many years when people talked about um, inclusion and exclusion, it was mostly poverty that was focused on. But that's definitely not a wide enough lens through which to see and understand the multifactorial impacts of social exclusion. So poverty um, is relative or absolute, can be relative. So if we think about poverty as being relative or absolute, if I was in the space with you, I would now be talking to you and trying to get your ideas of those two processes, um, um, absolute or relative. But I'll give you an example instead. Um, these are two pictures that I took when I was still working in South Africa. And I was working in schools that you can clearly see um, there was a lot of poverty. This was the school building, which was falling apart. You can't really see, but the windows are pretty smashed up. If you look at the classroom inside, uh, nothing on the walls. So there was both a poverty of education and poverty of the actual uh, situation in which, which they, they found themselves. You'll also see that they're crowded around very few um, desks and tables. Um, and so for, for me, um, that's an example of a really poor educational space. Um, but, but it's all relative, um, because when I came to Australia, I was taken to a school, and the first thing that um, people told me at that school was that this is a disadvantaged school. 
Um, and I walked in and I saw anything but, in my view, disadvantaged because the, these students had everything that I could possibly wish for this school in South Africa. But it's relative. It's all relative because in terms of an Australian community and an Australian society, this was seen as an impoverished, disadvantaged school. So we always need to be looking at those issues of inclusion and diversity within the context in which um, it happens. So in the 1990s there was an expansion of the concept of inclusion and exclusion um, and what the expansion entailed mostly, um, I, I'll leave you to read this yourself, but just mostly the fact that we, we, no longer know, we now no longer just talk about poverty, we talk about other important dimensions of inclusion and exclusion. So social exclusion um, happens when there's a series of problems. So all of those factors, unemployment, discrimination, low income, etc., might all be within one picture of a particularly inclusive or exclusive um, society. So social ex the concept of social exclusion is broader than a focus just on material resources, on income. Um, people can be socially excluded even if they have sufficient income or material resources. Um, what, what, um, we, what you can do later on is to just record how you think people have been socially excluded. Um, that is beyond just material resources and income and so on. And we'll um, discuss it at a, at a later point. So if we look at um, social exclusion, here are some of the, the ways in which um, societies or people can be excluded. And these are taken from the UNESCO document, which I have up for you on, on Moodle. So abused children, child laborers, etc. Have a look at that list. Some of them you may not have thought about, or some of them you may have. Um, HIV, AIDS, orphans is a very strong exclusionary, social exclusion within a lot of African countries particularly. Children in conflict zones, etc. I'm not, um, I haven't lost my place, I'm just pausing so that you can have a look at that list. So what are the different dimensions? A person is socially excluded if he or she is unable for, for whatever reason to for I'll start again. A person is socially excluded if he or fortunately there is editing processes. A person is socially excluded if, if he or she is unable for whatever reason to fully access or participate in the key activities and resources of society. So there are four dimensions, consumption, production, political engagement, and social interaction. And my heart really goes out to this little boy. I found this picture somewhere, I don't even know, and I'm going to be up for um, copyright infringement because I don't know where I got it from. Um, but you can just see how much he wants to be in that circle, but he is just excluded in some way, shape, or A bit like when I go to a cocktail party. I feel the same way sometimes when I try to engage in that cocktail party. Okay, so the four aspects are consumption, production, political engagement, and social interaction. Um, so if we look at consumption, it's, it's all about being able to buy goods and services, production, being able to participate economically, political engagement, involvement in decision-making, and social interaction, being able to integrate and participate with family, friends, and community. So as I've been trying to um, clarify, and I've probably over-clarified it at this point, um, the understanding of inclusion and exclusion expanded in the late 1990s. Um, Social exclusion is relative, but it, its effects are ongoing and cumulative. So if, if you exclude it on one level, 
um, that impacts on how you um, operate in society and so other factors will come along and, and, and it will be like a cyclical effect. Um, it's relative to the prevailing social norms, standards and expectations. Um, children may be excluded in schools because they, they do, or in, in, in early childhood uh, spaces because they don't necessarily fit the expectations within that space. Um, agency is involved. That is, it's not inevitable. Um, it is caused by an act or some individual group or institution. A person may exclude themselves by choice or they may be excluded by the decisions of other people, organisations or institutions. Um, it's not confined to current circumstances. If, ex if children are excluded, they, it also may limit their, their future prospects. So social exclusion is said to be a dynamic process, best described as descending levels. Some disadvantage lead to exclusion, which in turn leads to more disadvantage and more social exclusion and disadvantage. Um, and it, it ends up with persistent multiple deprivation, disadvantages. Individuals, households and spatial units can be excluded from access to resources like employment, health, education, social or political life. And it's often this kind of domino effect. So social inclusion is about overcoming the barriers that cause people to feel exclusion. Social inclusion is making sure people are connected socially and in their broader community. And there are certain um, people within a community that may be seen as particularly vulnerable and needing more support in order to remain within an inclusive um, society. So these are some of the factors that may affect social inclusion. And it's going to take far too long for us to have a discussion around this. So um, again, just look at the slide, think about ways in which people are socially, socially excluded and we'll come back to it um, next week. So another definition or another way of looking at social inclu inclusion and particularly in terms of education Inclusive education is a process of strengthening the capacity of the education system to reach out to all learners. As an overall principle, it should guide all educational policies and practices, starting from the fact that education is a basic human right and the basics of a more just and equal society. So if we look at approaches to education, uh, um, it's it's along a continuum, and in the good or bad old days, uh, this was where inclusion was set, in this, this sort of special education sector. And by saying that, and, and by saying that I do support this kind of inclusion, that's not saying that I don't think that different people have different needs, and that there may be a, a place for special education um, depending on um, the circumstances, situation, um, and, and abilities of, of children. But we've generally moved away from that to, to that, where inclusion locates problems in the environment, not the child. Um, it, it adapts to the, the environment of the child and respects diversity uh, and promotes equity of access in the same way as we, we saw that picture of the, of the children in a row, um, getting equity to access that um, game. Very vague about that game because I'm not sure what kind of game it is. It looked like a, a cricket match to me, but what, my, what I know about sport is a bit dangerous. So, um, international legal context, putting it into international legal concept, um, starting from 1948, which is, the universal, which is when the Universal Declaration of Human Rights first appeared, um, up to 2007, um, where the United Nations um, created the Declaration 
of indigenous rights of indigenous people. So again, have a look at that. Women at least sort of started to get a look in 79, um, children 89, and so on. Diversity and cultural expression, 2005. Getting towards, oh, we've got a few more. Okay, so now this one can 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 you see that very clearly? Um, I was just um, talking to my camera operator. Um, so we start off at the top, which is the education system has the full responsibility to the to ensure the right to education. So all children have a basic right to education. So how is education equipped and ready to handle diversity? It's equipped and ready to handle diversity when there are flexible teaching and learning methods, when there are reorientating teacher education, in other words, doing more teacher education, more quality teacher education, where there's flexible curriculum, um, and where there's a response to diverse need, and it's not overloaded with academic content, which I hope today's lecture hasn't been. Um, I think it probably has been, but never mind, you will survive. Um, welcoming of diversity, um, involvement of parents in the community, and early identification and, rec and remediation of children at risk. And we'll be talking quite a lot in the next couple of weeks about children's vulnerabilities and children at risk and how we um, help children and support children to become resilient in very exclusive um, situations. And so from how the education system is equipped, we go to um, the more practical side of it, um, engaging with fle flexible teaching methods, with innovative approaches, to teaching aids and equipments, as well as the use of ICTs. So all the sort of 21st century um, uh, tools that we have to increase that teaching flexibility. And then from there, we move into what is exceptionally important in inclusion and diversity, and that's having responsive, child-friendly environments uh, and professional environments working deliberately and actively to promote inclusion for all. And that's where even the best intention centres sometimes um, fall down a little bit because they think they're doing inclusion and diversity, but some of them don't necessarily take enough time to think about deliberately and actively promoting inclusion and so on. Lots of and so on is happening now, I'm getting tired. Um, okay, so according to the Melbourne, uh, hang on. So according to the Melbourne Declaration of, on Education Goals for Young Australians, Australian schools must provide all students with access to high-quality schooling that is free from discrimination based on gender, language, sexual orientation, pregnancy, culture, ethnicity, religion, health or disability, socio-economic background or geographic location. This kind of jars for me, this pregnancy in the middle of that list, but, you know, that's what it says. And, and I think it's because they really don't want to exclude any sort of form, so rather than um, leaving poor pregnant people out, um, it's put in. But it does seem to... Seems more of, of a specific than some of those general um, sort of terms that are there. So the reason why um, I talked about the Melbourne Declaration is a because of its importance in terms of inclusion and diversity, but b because um, in two thousand and five, Drama Australia that I'm very involved with. Um, and it's known to be the Peak Drama Educators Association in Australia, launched a groundbreaking document on equity and diversity, which was particularly related to drama and theatre education. But I would argue strongly that if one looks at 
um, the drama and, edu and um, Australia policy documents that it's equally applicable to anyone in education um, teaching any um, um, subject matter. So it was titled the Drama Australia Equity and Diversity Guidelines and its aim was to reflect on the ways in which gender, sexuality, disability and cultural and linguistic um, issues impact on drama education. Now the reason why we specifically link, put those in is that the new one, which I'll show you about, show you now in a minute, um, actually has another one. It has socio-economic status, which was not actually included in that um, 2005 original document. So in 2013, uh, no, we're in 2015, not 2013, 2015, very recently, um, I was involved in um, revising that, that document and it's going to be, in, be launched in July at the Drama Australia conference in Sydney. Um, and um, it has that extra socio-economic status attached to it. Now, one of the things that um, um, is in there is each of the different um, each of the different um, aspects um, have um, some guideline um, principles prior to a more dis a document that discusses how to use drama to promote equity, etc. So this is the part that I um, was involved with. Um, and it's a very small part of the document, um, but it's looking at, um, oh no, this is the general one, this is the one that's, that's overriding, and then we go to more specific. So all of us agreed that these were some of the things that we would like to look at when it comes to equity and diversity. Equity, inclusiveness, pluralism, which is acknowledging different differences and multiple perspectives and so on. Diversity and empowerment. Freedom from constraint and the freedom to develop towards one's human potential. And this is the one, as you can see, Carter in Drama Australia 2015, which is the start of my um, cultural and linguistic part of the document. Um, and it's a very small part, and I will probably be um, showing you the whole document at some point because I think there are a lot of sort of really good. Um, aspects of it, even if I may say so myself. Um, and this is just the beginning. So what are the, some of the things that I feel very strongly in terms of, of diversity? Honouring and respecting cultural and linguistic diversity in educational settings. Developing and using drama curriculum and processes that are responsible to diverse needs. Of course, again, I'll reiterate that that doesn't only necessarily apply to drama, but this is a drama document. Embracing the possibilities of rich, unique, cultural and linguistic, human and environmental resources. So all the resources that you can embrace in order to um, have an impact on equity. Um, establishing drama classroom practices that reflect and value dramatic convention and characteristics of culturally and linguistically diverse communities. So again, getting those characteristics um, and looking at them carefully, providing opportunities for students to utilize their linguistic and cultural capital and funds of knowledge in creating and responding to drama processes and products, again, in responding to any kind of educational processes, using, making real use of those linguistic and cultural capitals and funds of knowledge that children bring to, to the educational environment, and encouraging students to explore and ex express cultural identities and multiple perspectives. And, and that's a particularly important part of drama is that ability to take on different roles and, and look at those multiple perspectives. And so, thereby, ended this marathon, <laughs> feels like a marathon, and those are some of the um, things that I have consulted, um, and, but this will all be up on Moodle. And I will also be taking you through a process um, for the tutorial, which you may do um, in the tutorial space. Saturday you don't have an option. Saturday you have to stay. Um, but those of you who feel you can do the work um, on your own, in your own time, um, you, you could 
you can do that, but just give me the opportunity to explain to you what needs to be done.